What's up, everybody? Welcome to Mike Dawes Has a Podcast. My name is Mike Dawes, and I do, in fact, have a podcast. This show is all about guitar, guitarists, and the music industry. Joining me on this journey are some friends who I've met on the road over the years, and I'm honored to share some conversations with guests I'll be meeting for the first time. Let's dive right into it. Plenty's here, everybody, from Australia. How are you doing, man? It's been a long time since I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. It has been a long time, but I'm good. Yeah, when did Despite I even last see you? Time. In real life. When was the last time we Vegas. hung out? Oh, shit. Yes, it was. Must have been Vegas. Yeah. It must have been. Yeah. That was on your... Yeah, with Periphery. I didn't even yeah. see your show there. I'm going to take my, 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 my hoodie off. It's getting getting hot oh, in here late at night. Absolutely. Well, it's the morning where you are, because you're in Australia, and uh, it's midnight here. We finally got the time right for this, because we were going to do it <laughs> at... <laughs> we were going to do it at... 11 minutes past 11 on the 11th of the 11th. Yeah. And uh, and Which then I forgot. You weren't there for. <laughs> <laughs> and then I wasn't there for it yesterday. And then we and now seem to both be here at the same time. Now it's Friday the 13th. Oh. Yeah. Spooky. 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 I don't know when this one will go out. This I think this might be one of the first ones to go out because of the timing of your album, which is a new album, which should be a, out around now, like either very soon or just very recently on the 27th of November. And it's called Impulse Voices. And you sent it to me earlier today. And I think it is your best album because I've listened to it twice and uh, it hasn't let me down yet. Really, sincerely, I, I mean that. Um, yeah, uh, tell tell people about your album while I sip this tea. That was well. That was you said exactly the right thing to me. Thank you for enjoying <laughs> it. <laughs> well, it's an album and it's new, and I like it a lot, especially because of what other people did on it. Um, that's that's the press release. Nice. I think that's more or less what the official press release is. I just said it in more words. But oh, nice one. I think it's good and also the people on it are good. So <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to um yeah, Simon and Chris on Instagram earlier, your longtime collaborative partners. And yeah, I mean I, I just literally messaged Chris before you came on here. Um, I guess as he's woken up about the same time in Australia just to kind of compliment him on the drumming. And I told him that through this thing I'm doing with you today, I'm just going to talk about him and his playing because it's pretty freaking ridiculous, so, dude. I'm so down for that. And also, I just realized you were at the beginning of my journey with Christopher Allison, including the very first gig we played together, which started out pretty unexceptionally. I don't know What's if you mean? remember. I don't remember it being unexceptional. I remember it being in a basement and being a lot of fun. Why was it unexceptional? Oh, the gig was... The gig was great, but the first song we played, uh, a certain member of the band whose job is to keep in time, <laughs> totally lost, like in the middle of an odd time signature bit. And I was I like, mean, oh, is this what it's all going to be like now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember Troy. I know Troy. Yeah, because Troy was with us in Vegas last time I saw you. Um, he yeah. was your old drummer. And I remember, hold on. I'm, I'm getting my timing. We played a gig we together. We did play a gig together, so that would have been before Australia. Yeah, that was, Troy was in the 2017. Band. That was fun. And that then, was they were oh, it fun. was all to 2017. Sorry, it was August and October. Yeah, this was at the Roxy in LA, which was really, uh, dude, I was really, really stoked you asked me to jump up for that. That was really fun. Um, that was not part of your tour or anything, or it was for you. But I was just um, yeah, you hanging were. out in the area. You were just a, and, a blowing, um, as you are always. <laughs> yeah, just came and did weird stuff pretty badly and then watched you guys <laughs> play. And it was pretty fun. Tosin was there. <laughs> um, loads of cool people were there. Uh, so thanks for that. Yeah. So yeah, that I, I, I just put two and two together now. So yeah, I must have played that show with you in Sydney, which was Chris's first show. So Chris Allison is Pliny's drummer. And man, the drumming on this record is insane. Um, but this isn't the first time he recorded. I presume he was on uh, the Sunhead EP as well. Before yeah. For that. Yeah, amazing guy. Yeah, and my friend has a huge crush on him as well. Okay. He uh, apparently well, he played in Bristol uh, in my hometown here. And um, yeah, she, um, she, she, she's in love with him. But uh, I won't name who she is because she, she has a boyfriend. So. Well, he has a 
long term partner, but I'm sure he appreciates the love. <laughs> I think we should do posters of him. He's so majestic. He's got a very full beard. That was it. Warm That's what smile. she said. Who is that bearded, bearded Viking behind the drums? I reckon like a Putin style shirtless on a horse, Chris Allison poster. <laughs> Why stop at a poster? Why not make it a full calendar? Can this, or can the thumbnail for this podcast be topless Chris on a horse? I believe a guy called Jake is going to edit this. So Jake, if you're listening, do that. If not, uh, then <laughs> you're fired. <laughs> oh, if he's going to edit this, then most of this probably won't be in it anyway. <laughs> oh no, but by edit, I mean listen and compress the audio. No, there's no okay. escape. <laughs> and sp- speaking of no escape... Um, so the date is the 13th of November, and a few days ago you broke the internet, and I don't know if you want to talk about it or not, um, Well, I got, because it's probably some, quite new, isn't it? I have some hot exclusive gossip for you that's going to be very not hot by the time this comes out. <laughs> I woke up this morning to a new follower and a DM from Doja Cat, and she sent me a bunch of voice messages which were really nice, basically saying... Sorry, this happened, and thanks for being cool about it, and a couple of other things, and like all the best sort of thing. That's wicked, man. Yeah. So, so this is, yeah. um, yeah. Well, you are a nice guy, and you did handle it very well. And for those, for anyone listening who's not aware of what we're talking about, basically, can I elaborate? But I'll do it really nicely, and then also sure. say that I'm a douchebag because I did something similar once by accident. Oh, I'd love to. I want to hear this story. So, yes, please. <laughs> So basically, I was on, I don't know why I I mentioned a personal anecdote. Basically, what happened is the MTV Awards, was it the European MTV Awards or something like that, was a few days ago. And this pop artist named, you just pronounced it Doja Cat. I thought it was like Doge Cat, like Doge Dog. (laughs) Oh, I I I'm an idiot. Me too. (laughs) But um, yeah, I saw this performance and um, it was like a metal version of this big pop you know, it was trending on YouTube, right? So she must be like Lady Gaga, you know, Cardi B, big act, singer. I honestly am an idiot and I live in a cave, so I don't actually know. But evidently <laughs> she has a ton of fans. And then I was watching it because it was this kind of cool metal vibe. And then your song kind of appeared in it, um, not particularly <laughs> subtly from a listener's point of view. And then your fans kind of noticed and then they entered the chat And then I guess you kind of noticed (laughs) and then you were like, oh, that's really flattering and sweet. Whereas a lot of them were less (laughs) kind, I suppose. Is that, is that a good way of of saying it? Is that that all all the facts? Yeah. I mean, I, out of like a hundred thoughts that I have, I usually, I end up putting one on the internet. So I had like, I am capable of all the petty thoughts and angry thoughts too, (laughs) but I like to hold my tongue for a second and be like, wait, what does this actually mean to me? I think it's pretty fucking funny. But like, injustice aside, it's just mostly funny. It's funny because in your words, a song that you wrote in your bedroom ends up being played on the MTV European Music Awards a few years yeah, later. Which it's is like funny. <laughs> It is pretty funny. Um, and I shared, yeah, I think I shared your potential primary and, and gut reflex when I saw it, just because I'm not as gracious as you with that kind of stuff. And <laughs> I'm not as good at holding my tongue about things like that. So, you know, I, I, I think I kind of made a stupid pun and, and kind of left it because it's obviously your business. But but yeah, there were a lot of fans who were really, uh, um, a lot of fans of yours who were really uh, quite kind of pissed off at the at what they perceived as the kind of big man pop machine uh, kind of treading on what they, I guess, as prog kind of guitar dudes would perceive as the sort of underground kind of act, which totally does happen. But the thing that, that I wasn't very good at holding my tongue about, and I'll say to you, is that I saw a response from what I believe was the person who wrote the arrangement or, you know, arranged yeah. the arrangement. And I just thought it was a little bit tacky. And that's just my take. Um, and yeah. it was definitely a contrast with what I would consider the sort of decent kind of nice 
thing to say. I think he called himself a musical genius whilst at the same time kind of saying, I like Pliny to try and make it all better. And uh, yeah, that didn't really read too well as a Brit. And I, I, maybe maybe I understand if you don't want to comment on that. But um, yeah, fuck that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I think there is a bit of a culture clash between both our attitudes and the attitude of a, I guess, what's a, I guess it's a bit of a geographical stereotype, but a music director in LA. Yeah. Okay. Has a certain personality that I feel like would be really easy to make an AI of because it's mostly just a fire emoji. Um, and a fist, a bro fist. Yeah. yeah. But it's like the same thing, like that is what it is. We know that kind of person exists, so it's funny. It's weird. Well, when I saw some of the things he said, I like, I want to think that he means well and he loves making music. So. Totally. Absolutely. I will retract what I said before about, you know. No, you can keep it. No, no, you well, definitely yeah, keep but, it. Yeah, but 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 again, it's not, it's not it's not it's <laughs> not it's not my business. It's not anyone else's business but yours at the end of the day, man. And it's really admirable how you're kind of handling this. And and congratulations, because you know your riff essentially from the tune "Handmade Cities" has essentially been heard by millions of people that otherwise probably wouldn't have heard it, which is pretty damn cool. Yeah. And um, yeah, and it was it was a really really cool thing to see, and a really cool thing to see how you handled it as well. I saw you retweeted uh, another musician's kind of response about it and how the industry actually works, and a lot of your fans, um, you know, who perhaps don't have as much experience behind the curtain, might have thought that it was perhaps her, the artist, who who uh, was sort of more involved with that than she perhaps might have been, and it was really I nice to love see that. that kind of clarification. I would love if it was her, if like she was at home a week before the performance in Logic, like ripping the song <laughs> and then we could just have a fierce DM battle and be like, what the fuck? You stole my song. And she'd be like, fuck you, you suck. But actually, yeah, like the real industry is way more boring and complicated and full yeah, of communication. I mean, that's it, man. That's it. But hopefully, you know, credit you where it's due and hopefully everything has been resolved um yeah if you're listening or watching and and want to check it out check out what we're talking about it's yeah doja cat d-o-g-a-c-a-t mtv european music awards and it's uh a track called say so um and it's it's really cool it's a cool arrangement i do like it um it's, it is, it's actually yeah, it's, quite infectious and yeah yeah you should uh, maybe try and incorporate some of that into your next 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 set I would love to Doja Cat if you're listening to this because of course you're following my album press on the internet <laughs> let's do it <laughs> well hey talking about like your the album and, and and logic and stuff something I really wanted to ask you um uh because when I was listening to this album earlier the main thing that struck me was it seemed to be that I guess the song and the music took much more of a front seat versus the guitar as an individual part of that, right? Versus the previous stuff that I've heard you do, like the EP that came before this. And um, I'll exclude the the bird surface thing because that's like a little separate thing. Um, yeah. But it sounds to, it sounded to me like I, I I couldn't comprehend how someone could write this album on a guitar. How much of it was actually written on the guitar other than maybe the top line? Or it, it sounds like you're a scientist, you know, and you've gone into this like door <laughs> and, and, and you're incredibly clever with it and amazing with it. But was much of that written on the guitar itself? Yeah. Um, I think program drums and bass and guitar. There wasn't uh, most of everything else came later, but... The songs were like all the original demos started out with mostly bass and drums because the guitar, there are a lot of parts where the guitar isn't really doing anything except playing a little sprinkly thing on top. Um, right. Yes, yeah, so a lot of like programming bass lines and programming drums. Um, but I think the reason it sounds like that is there was probably more guitar in the writing process that got replaced 
with other sounds. So it's kind of like a built up a certain way and then unbuilt from the bottom, leaving the top half only. So was that Simon's that role? Was that much more of a was that much more of a, a sort of producer thing after the fact, kind of trimming the fat? Um, no, I sort of finish it all and just send the stems to Simon to mix, um, and he does a bit of like production in terms of certain tones and like what to highlight more and that sort of thing. Um, but that was kind of like the end of the songwriting process. Um, about the time that I was sending demos to Chris, I started recording like the final guitar parts and properly arranging it. And then he would do demos for all the songs and I would remove my 10 layers of useless percussion loops. And then at that point, the song was kind of closer to finished. Nice. Yeah, it, it's, it sounds like so much uh, thought has gone into the composition. Not that that wasn't present on the previous stuff, of course, but I was like A, being the Sunhead stuff, like kind and some of the handmade city stuff and then and then listening to this new stuff and man like the the experimentation with sounds and textures is just like amplified so much and honestly man i think it's one of the i think it's the best the best thing i've i've heard you do really like I, i'm just really gutted for you that you can't tour it right now because it has so much <laughs> potential for like a show you know and a stage production and all of yeah. that did you have any anything cool planned for that that got cancelled uh well i was going to do a world tour <laughs> I mean, in terms Which, of specific stage show and production. No, I mean, not really. I don't, I don't think the budget's there yet. I definitely would have had a better light show than ever before. Um, and that would have been pretty fun, uh, but nothing too crazy yet. Although I was thinking that I would do it as at least a five piece and have Dave play keys everywhere. Um, cause it's a lot more piano and synth stuff and that'd be fun. Um, but we'll do it one day, I hope. Yeah, I hope so. I was thinking earlier, man, um, I really want to get back, back down to Australia at some point. Um, it's such a beautiful part of the world and, uh, so few people are able to get down there and I was very lucky to be able to go down there and really grateful for you sort of allowing me to jump up for a few shows as well while I was down there. That kind of worked out really nice and that was a lot of fun. And you had that bigger setup there with the keys and the, you had a saxophone as well. Ah, oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> that did work out weirdly well because I think we were already looking at like one of two weekends and you were already going to be in Australia. And so if we could do it on that certain weekend, I would basically get you for free thanks to uh, what's his face. So that was, yeah. Yeah, session session man. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, that that worked out great. So basically, what happened is I was uh, down in Australia playing with uh, Justin Hayward, who's the front man of the Moody Blues, and it's been a long time session sort of gig. And uh, yeah, plenty hit me up out of the blue to to play some shows, and it turned out that I was going to be down there anyway. Uh, and I got to spend a week sort of uh, kipping at your mate Kieran's place, uh, which was a lot of fun. Yeah. Hanging out with the cockatoos. And uh, doing all that stuff and uh, looking out for giant spiders that I was terrified of because I'm British and pathetic. <laughs> but um, hey, on the album, in terms of tones and things, because I know a lot of people are going to be like gear nerds. That's why this whole thing is kind yeah. of working with Tonewood Amp, which I, a company I work with a lot. It's more on the acoustic side, you know, the little device that you Man. stick on a guitar. I've, I've, I've shown you it before. But, um, I wish I played this acoustic thing, guitar because... Sorry, I need to cut you off to say unnecessary nice things. That is one of the sickest pieces of gear I've ever seen. And I wish I had any use for it because it's just so ridiculously cool. So shout we'll out get an to Tony Woodford. But I'd, I'd never use it. Like I'd never need, it would never be something that I would need. Never say never in the words of Justin Bieber. <laughs> No, seriously, shout out to Tone Woodamp for making something really cool, which is behind me, actually. It's just there. But um, that's not super applicable to this album, but the neural DSP stuff is. I wanted to ask you about that. How much of the tones and on the record were done through your plug-in and how much were done through Simon's sort of magic and other means? Um, 100, well, this is, this is a false statistic. 100% of the ones that used my plug-in used my plug-in. Um, <laughs> 
I think it turned out to be all the leads and all the cleans. And I'm not sure about rhythm. I know some of the rhythm Simo ran through his 5150 and a marshal of some kind. Um, and I know in some of it he did some weird stuff with pedals, fuzz, and mad science. But I think generally all the leads and cleans on my plugin and all the rest is Simon's mad science. Yeah, I mean, well, shout out to uh, to Simon Grove and also to the plugin because that I actually that's the one kind of electric guitar thing that I've been using in this kind of new studio is your plugin, um, specifically versus shout out to to me. Yeah, shout out shout out to Doug. Um, and... Mostly shout out to Doug and Todd. <laughs> yeah, the Neural DSP guys. So if if you guys are listening and interested at all in sort of electric guitar tones and uh gadgetry at your desktop uh the neural dsp plugins are essentially well can, can you you could probably explain it in a in a, in a better way than i could being an, an acoustic gremlin you're a, you're more of a techie dude uh, what am i explaining what they are i guess they're the most realistic and compact uh digital version of the sort of guitar rig that you would go out and buy 10 years ago but but how does it work? H- you plug a guitar get... and it sounds just like real life. So that's it. That's it. Don't worry about the middle stuff. Don't worry about the tech. Just the outcome. The outcome is that your guitar will sound beautiful if you're plugged in to the Neural DSP plugin, yeah. which you can get from neuraldsp.com. Tosin's got one. You've got one. Corey Wong's got one, which I haven't tried yet. Have you Have you had a chance to try that one? Yeah, it's super fun. But don't buy that one. Don't don't buy that one. Buy Pliny's one. Yeah. It is the best. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's it is my favorite actually, my personal favorite. I've been doing a bit more electric guitar stuff during this bullshitty lockdown, um, and that's been the the the, the go to rig. It's the second lockdown here in the UK right now, dude. It's uh, pretty yeah. pretty boring and lots of time to play. How are things over there? It, it's 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 amazing we've got to this stage of of a chat and haven't spoken about like the world. We were doing well. Oh, um, it's pretty good. <laughs> it's- some states of Australia are totally normal. Like you remember our friend Raul, he did the marketing for like a 12,000 person festival in Perth. Shout out to Raul. He sent He's me, amazing. He, yeah, he sent me a photo of like as a drone photo of this festival. And I was like, how is this something happening responsibly like on the other side of the country? And because they're totally fine. It's just the world of Perth has wow. resumed. Well, that is like, that is Eastern Australia's kind of most populated, Western Australia, right? West, most yeah. Most populated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's also the most remote city in the world, which maybe helped yeah. uh, with that. Um, and I think Queensland and other states are doing pretty well. They're having like 2,000 cap gigs. So it shouldn't be too long before we have an Australia tour bubble, which... We'll provide at least five days of excitement. <laughs> you could go to Wollongong for a sixth a sixth show. Yeah. You just you only just wanted to say that, I could tell. I've I've been waiting for about half an hour to say that. That's it, man, because <laughs> when I was down there it was uh I played four shows in Australia and it was uh Sydney, Melbourne, Sydney, Melbourne. <laughs> what the dates. <laughs> <laughs> But I remember seeing Wollongong on the uh, on the on the flight board in the at the airport. But uh, but yeah, man, it's um, well, obviously over here is kind of a bit grim, and today was just a bit of a kind of kind of grim, miserable day with miserable news as as, uh, as usual. But uh, looking forward to having you back in the UK because last time you were here, I missed you. I keep missing your shows. Actually, I did see you in Bristol, yeah. uh, not not too long ago with um, Tesseract. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and my girlfriend stole loads of your oranges. And was walking around town oh, because we had all this, fruit. Yeah, we had all this fruit left. And it was like, well, I don't want it to go to waste. Maybe no one's going to come and pick it up till tomorrow. So that's that's it. So Bristol, uh, for anyone not familiar with Bristol, um, is a very eco-conscious city, right? It's about, it's probably the most like lefty kind of city next to like Brighton in the country. And uh, my girlfriend's a, a student here or was. Uh, graduating in graduated in 2020 which is a horrific time to graduate 
Um, Congratulations. But, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's no jobs. Um, but um, yeah, uh, an aerospace engineer and a touring musician walk into a pandemic. <laughs> but uh, no one wins. Yeah. <laughs> no one wins. But uh, but yeah, she she saw your your apples and oranges backstage and uh, kind of uh, just couldn't let them go to waste. And then we ended up going out, went to some bars, and uh, she was cradling this fruit. I remember. And then I was cradling because it was too much. I felt like a bit of a mad kind of fruit scientist. But that was that was a sick show with Tesseract and between the buried and me. Any any plans to go back out with them after this is all done, or are you kind of just looking at headline kind I'd, of stuff in support of the album? I'd say yes to anything at this point. Um, yeah, totally. I think especially between the Merit and me, because Tesseract, we did the States and then Europe. Um, between the Merit and me was just Europe, so I'd love to do the States with them sometime. Um, it all sounds so optimistic, just talking about doing things. That's the thing, man. That's what's making me really excited, just hearing people talk about shows and things, because... You know, you yeah. get so accustomed to living in that way. And then like like when we hung out in Vegas, that wasn't I think I flew across country just to like hang because everyone was there. Like I have a lot of friends living <laughs> in Vegas and you were on tour with a lot of my friends as well. And uh and I was on tour in the States but had like a couple of days off and then met the uh met the immortal Mike Scoma with you. Um and uh yeah, I had a fun night in Las Vegas and uh yeah. It's just an, an odd, a, a very odd shift for lots of people in this kind of touring bubble. Um, but uh, but yeah, and speaking of a touring-y kind of stuff, something else I wanted to ask is, it's a bit of a cliche thing to ask, I suppose, with people that travel. But I know you're a bit of a coffee fiend, right? For the benefit of the listeners, that's a nod. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, my silence was a affirmative silence. Well, you know, it's a bit of a cliche to ask people about their favorite shows and their worst shows and things like that. But um, but I'm always up for learning about food spots and coffee spots. Any recommendations? Funnily enough, the most memorable coffee experience of my life happened right in Sydney, um, a place <laughs> called Ona. And there may or may not be a correlation between that being also part of the title of one of the songs on the new album. Oh, OK. I wondered what that meant. I mean, you can keep wondering because I haven't confirmed that that's what it meant. It just happened Probably. that we were also recording that song when we went to this cafe. And it was like over the top, a full tasting experience of different blends. And they all had a different shaped cup. In the same way, like you drink certain wine over a different shaped glass. They had like yeah, edges cocktails. that opened up and closed to like direct the flavors and the scents to you that was just fucking ridiculous so shout out really to really owner in sydney anywhere yeah. in england do we have any any good food do, do foreign people like any any food or drink in england yeah i had a really good walk around um with Jakob when we were there with periphery in bristol um i can't remember the name but like we we're at that venue that's quite close to i think a uni and yeah, were you were at the, students. if it was the Periphery O2, Tour, I think. yeah, the O2 Academy. So the O2 Academy is next to a giant car park and some student accommodation and things like that. So were you on Park Street? If you came out and went up like a big main road, there was a hill with loads of shops on either side. That's sort of yeah, the main street. Yeah, like a, some bridgey stuff and a park and maybe an old church or something. I mean, that's just Britain. Um <laughs> And Pirates and Banksy. Yeah. <laughs> we went to, I think, like three really nice cafes. Yeah, yeah there's some good spots around there, for sure. But um, there's... Oh, I'm, I'm pretty sure we went to The Spoons in Bristol. Which what, I think is, is, what is... What the fuck is your obsession with Spoons, dude? Like, every time you come to the UK, Spoons. I'm, I'm texting you, yeah. where do you want to meet? Spoons. It's the worst Massive place gear. you could possibly go to. Whatever. Um, when I first played in the UK for UK Tech Fest in 2015, um, me and Simon and Luke Martin, who's played piano on a bunch of my stuff, we were in, I think, Peterborough or maybe a small town called Whittlesea near Peterborough. And Luke took us to our first Spoons and it's just had a a warm place in my heart ever since. And I think the food that we got the last time was so bad. 
Like it was just cooled down and soggy hot food. It's not known for its cuisine or for anything good. It's it's honestly <laughs> the worst the worst place you could go. Please, touring musicians, do not listen to Pliny and go to Weatherspoons. Also, we all hate the guy who runs it because he's... Oh, uh, really? Yeah, he's just a bit of a scumbag. Um, you know, Johnny I mean, Spoon. Johnny Spoons, yeah. Um, jo- Johnny Spoons, the, the the dastardly Johnny Spoons with his handle, with his mustache and everything. Yeah, no, it, it, I think there was just uh, w- when the pandemic hit, especially. I mean, you know, politics aside, everyone has their their own you know views on things. But with the pandemic, there was a lot of sort of. I think it was in the press that he said we don't get coronavirus in Weatherspoons. <laughs> Or like <laughs> you, you can't get COVID in a spoons. It's because you're so cut by the time you, you enter, you're dead already. <laughs> exactly. Well, back when I was at school, it was beer and a burger for five pounds. That was the the whole thing. I think they probably still do that. Um, but there are better places, man. I, I was going to big you up and say you were a foodie as well because you're always posting, you know, nice nice things like that. And yeah, I know when I've hung out with you, we go to go and have some nice meals. But uh, where the yeah. spoons? There's a whole there's a whole range of things to enjoy in this world, and Weatherspoons probably <laughs> isn't one of them. <laughs> uh, it's it's but yeah. It's, Bristol had a bunch of sick food. Yeah, but there's there's some good spots here. It's uh, did you see the Banksy that was like right next to the venue? I wasn't paying attention. I was just staring at my phone trying to find spoons. <laughs> Exactly. Amazing. No, shout shout out to Bristol. Uh, it's a new city, just moved here. Um, and uh, yeah, lots of cool places. Illustrate's a good spot. There's a um, uh, new place called Number 50 on White Ladies Road for anyone that's that's local and wants to support local businesses during the uh, lockdown number two. Well, hello there, everyone. Apologies for the interruption to the podcast, but I did want to tell you about the amazing Tonewood Amp, the awesome sponsors of the show. Many of you will know already that I use this thing all the time, the magical little device that sticks with magnets to the back of your acoustic guitar, vibrates the back surface of the instrument so that reverb, delay, chorus, Leslie speaker effects and other loveliness project out of the sound hole as if by magic. You're a wizard. I'm a what? You can head to Mike Dawes has a podcast com now to get more information about the Tonewood amp as well as saving a tasty percentage for yourself. Let's get right back to it. Um, but yeah, but uh, well, back to the album, man. Um, you've released two <laughs> singles so far. Yeah, a bit of a tangent. Back to the album. You've released two singles. One of them I can't pronounce. Oh, is it two or is it more by now? No, it's just you said a tangent, and then all I thought was arc tangent because that's like near Bristol. And I was that is, gonna somehow. It is near Bristol. Shout out to Arc Tangent. Um, never been, but yeah. everyone who goes says it's like, like a, a good a good time. Yeah, it was great. Anyway, two singles. I can't pronounce one of them either. So. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm gonna attempt it. Pepe Lilio. Sure. Pepe Lilio. Okay. Sure. Okay. Coined. So, uh, what is that? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> like what? Well, according to. Some of my fans who speak Spanish, it's kind of like a slang word for the paper you use to roll a joint or a cigarette, which is not what I knew. I just know it as the name of a type of flower. So I went on like a long Wikipedia journey to find a pleasant word that was related to a flower that I like because the word that we use in Australia is bougainvillea, which if you're Australian, <laughs> is the part that's bogan, even though it's not spelled the same um, it's, it's just not a pleasant part of a word. So I eventually so bo- bogan is like bogan is what like like, like redneck, w- what would be the sort of yeah like like chav land, in the UK yeah. kind of thing yeah like fire emoji fire emoji and bro fist kind of thing or more um, more violent maybe not necessarily violent but more. I don't know. It's hard to think of a way to say it that's not insulting. Super offensive? Because I, yeah. Because it's not like people from the country compared to people from the city. There's a different, not worse. But I think the word bogan is one that describes them as somehow worse. But anyway, so it's a flower. 
<laughs> Amazing. No, no, no chance of a Pliny single in the future titled Bogan? I could do Boganville. And the cover will be like me, Chris, and Simo <laughs> out like in the country with a. Uh, do you know what a Ute is? Did we do this? I, I do. Like, is that like a wigwam type thing? What the fuck is no. a wigwam? Like you know, like a a triangular, you know. Oh, is that a yurt? That's a yurt. No, a Ute. Yeah, I think it's short for a utility vehicle, and it's uh, <laughs> okay. It's like a. A small truck that doesn't have an enclosed back, but like way a pickup. smaller than it's way smaller than a pickup truck and quite a little bit longer. So it's kind of like the front of a car with just a big, like a bed sized okay. uh, tray that you put stuff in. And that's like a super Australian car. I don't think they really exist anywhere else for some reason. Well, it's always interesting learning about Australian things. I remember the first time I, I, I visited Australia was um, with Gautier, the 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 pop, not uh, pop kind of cheapens it really. The the multi instrumental musical genius creator and national treasure, I would presume, um, in in Melbourne in 2013, and he he introduced me to ostentatious and the uh, the word. No, ostentatious. The, the 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 it was a number one song in Australia called Australiana, mm. I believe. Am I teaching uh, you something about Australia? It's a song yeah. that's entirely made up of Australia puns. Just a spoken word oh, Australia yeah, yeah. pun. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No. You I got it. Yeah. I think I got my facts right there. You know, did you hear what Didgery did? No, what did Didgery do? Etc. 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 Is is that a thing? I feel like Australia has a crazy amount of self-referential things as though we find it funny too. Like I can't imagine there's a French song that makes fun of stuff that other people think is funny about France, or maybe there is. That is a very, we have that in the UK as well. Like I actually heard something, I think it was John Cleese talking about the difference between like our kind of humor and like other Western types of humor and basically self depreciation and self mockery is I think I think he likened it to something like if if there's a guy like mopping the floor, I think I'm trying to I'm paraphrasing. If there's a guy mopping the floor and someone comes and like slaps the mop out of his hand, to us like the laugh comes from the gut the loser. Right, like the yeah. guy, mop not that people mopping are losers, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, whereas in, like, say, the states, <laughs> in like the states, the, the 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 hero of the joke is the guy kind of doing the act. If that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I guess I'm trying to relate sense. that. Yeah, there's just a lot of similarities with Australia and uh, and the UK, other than cricket and rugby rivalries, which I get a lot yeah. on tour with uh, with Tommy Emmanuel and his crew. <laughs> Um, have you have you ever um, done anything like played with Tommy? No, no, no interactions whatsoever. None of those camps because I know you did the Vi. Was it the Vi camp? I think he popped up. Did I did? Was it Vi or, or Petrucci? Yeah, like you know those music camps, the, the Dreamcatcher camp. events. Yeah. Stuff. How was it? Yeah. Ah, oh, so good. That was. Yeah, just so good. There was nothing your, bad. Your and I'm his hero. Is that what you're about to say? You're, you're his hero. No, I've just I've just seen a lot of <laughs> stuff that he's written about you, which is you know a lot of praise and and yeah. yeah. I mean, congrats. I mean, is he a big a, a big inspiration on yourself? I assume. Yeah, I think he's probably the like longest and biggest inspiration. Anyone else throughout my life? If you have. If you if you had three three sort of heroes that kind of shaped your your style because it's such a unique thing to you know I didn't grow up listening to a lot of like electric guitar music to be honest um, really because the cool yeah the, none at all like I didn't listen to Satriani or Vi or whatever I mean I was a Dream Theater fan for sure yeah but um, no when I was at school like the cool kid at school um, was playing like you know Eugene's Trick Bag and and all that stuff um, from really? like Crossroads. Yeah, and, and, and I kind, kind of, of saw that as... What school did you go to? 
<laughs> well, yeah, I mean, he was like one guy in the school. But uh, I, I just kind of didn't react well to... Th- I associated all that kind of music with the extroverted kind of show offy personality type, which yeah. I then kind of retreated into the, you know... I'll sit in the corner and I, I learned, you know, surfing with the alien and things like that. But Which is why you're now you know, a, a solo virtuoso guitarist to retreat from the spotlight. It's it, well, solo guitarist <laughs> for sure. But yeah, I was thinking um, how actually quite bizarre it is to kind of do the solo thing, actually. Um, I mean, and how preferable it would be to have a band like yourself to kind of jam with and, and, and play Man, with on stage. I was. Um, I was, this is a little blow of your trumpet. I was just listening to your live album before we did this. And I don't know how the fuck you do that. Like, what, do you ever have a bad day? Because if I have a yeah. bad day, there's three other people to give me better energy and also to like lift up. And, and to, to make mistakes on the first song so you don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're, like one person having a bad day is like a pretty deep hole with no ladder. Yeah, what do you well, do? that's it's very kind of you, but I mean, to be fair, the live album is the the best bits, isn't it? It's not like here's <laughs> a random gig. <laughs> Where I but it's split off in, in it's, the middle of the set. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, to be fair, it was. Um, the, the way that was recorded, the lion's share of that is two gigs, but they were two gigs that I was opening and the headliner, Justin Hayward, was having his stuff filmed and recorded. So I just kind of said, hey, here's like a fiver. Can you hit record on me as well? <laughs> so yeah. there, was, there was not a lot of like, uh, you know, planning for it to be a special kind of kind of thing um but fortunately the playing was okay but yeah i mean of course there's mistakes in the solo thing and i have i have this trauma of this one particular gig which was just every time i think about it i just get the biggest imposter syndrome and just feel <laughs> absolutely worthless and just want to crawl into bed and and just never come out again um that must have happened to you right like uh i mean you're you're obviously you know this 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 virtuoso wonder player that everybody loves everybody loves pliny but but does pliny ever 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 kind of fuck it yeah totally i think i might have i don't know if it's deliberate or subconscious but i've insulated myself a little bit because in a live set jake always has a lot of solos simon has solos chris has solos So no matter how much I fuck up, there's always an opportunity for me to go stand in the corner and then like recover. hide. Yeah. So this, and then if I'm doing well, everything's fine. But like, there's still plenty of like time out for where I'm the main feature. Um, Yeah. I don't know if I. I mean, it's 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 something that's really. Yeah. Sorry. It's it's really interesting to. Like if I was listening to to this and and also, you know, starting playing and starting doing the whole live performance thing, um, it, it's really I find it really interesting talking to other people about how they deal with mistakes and things like that because you know we're not Instagram clips, you know, on tour <laughs> you are a human being you know some live shows are more on rails than others for sure, <laughs> but you know at the end of the day how you deal with the mistakes live is a big part of anyone's show actually you know there's nothing more like when i go see a show if i if i see someone being super uncomfortable on stage kind of uh you know trying to sweat through something um even if they play it perfectly it just kind of translates as a little bit little bit of a strange sensation you know you kind of feel sorry for someone on stage um whereas i'd much rather see someone just jumping around acting like an idiot and not and, and bumming a few notes you know that's not so much of a huge deal but then you have you know people like you know yourself every time i've seen you play and steve Vai especially i i've never seen him like mess up tommy emmanuel is another one he's just always on it man it's crazy but um but yeah do you have any kind of philosophy about that i mean when you like if you do mess up do you internalize it and does it kind of ruin the show for you are you super critical do you come off stage saying oh i thought that gig was going to be great but i made five mistakes so i'd never want to think about it again you know, how do you deal with that kind um, of thing? 
Mm. I just mostly laugh. It's, I think, <laughs> again, about the like insulation thing. If I make a mistake, I know that there's three other people on stage currently playing something really well who will all laugh at me. And that's a good thing. Um, whereas if I made a mistake, ooh, what has just happened? Adobe wants me to update something. You're all good here. Thanks, I'm Adobe. Back. Um, what was I saying? Yeah, if it was like a me show and I made a mistake, then all I would do is think about how I made that mistake and probably start thinking, oh, what else is coming up in this song for me to fuck up? Yeah. Oh, man. But having, it's like, so true. But having other people who are like, suck shit, you idiot. Like a lot of the time, Jake will literally say things like that in my ear when I play a wrong note. And it's the best. Like that's the moral support that you want and need in a band. Um, I guess the other thing is just the amount of practice that we do and don't really talk about in terms of like the years of playing leading up to doing it and then rehearsals and practicing the songs. That just makes it so much more comfortable. Yeah, totally. I mean, I mean, the, 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 the banter side of it, I can only imagine is really fun because the solo <laughs> thing, is, is, there's, there isn't that. But also the other kind of gig that I have is this session gig where if you mess up, it's kind of like, am I going to like get in trouble? Because it's, you know, someone's kind of hiring you to to do a good job, you know. That's actually something that's really good about Justin, uh, the guy I play with, because he's so forgiving when you mess up. I remember the first show that I ever did in America. He brought me to America. You know, I was 23 years old. First time I've ever been introduced to this kind of touring world with the bus and the hotels and the crew, <laughs> the guitar tech, right? And all this stuff. And I'm just like this weird English, you know, idiot. <laughs> and I like to play in lots of different tunings, right? And um, first time with a guitar tech, I write down the tunings and okay, I'm, this song is in this. Please take my baby, my guitar. Please don't break it whilst at the same time trying to be respectful because someone is a professional at their job. And perhaps maybe yeah. I was a bit too trusting because literally the first first chord of the first song, I just hit it and was in the complete wrong tuning. <laughs> <laughs> the first the first like like oh my gosh i've got a session gig my my family have validated my years of weirdo guitar music because they know the name the moody blues and it's a real gig and all this and yeah and i kind of did it and just looked up at at, at justin and he was sort of looking at me and i was like oh i'm so fired man you know but uh <laughs> but i had to handle it i had to bend down and mute, hit the tuner and just did it and then back in the game and at the end of the show he just said you know i knew exactly what the problem was don't worry about it like you know super forgiving and it's not to say we play really sloppily or anything but um but that is a real benefit but yeah i've never experienced the uh the benefit of someone calling me like an absolute shit ass for messing up which does sound quite fun yeah one of my favorites was this was just playing i don't think anyone had made a mistake um but jake said in my ear we're probably playing like a hard unison part together and he goes no one will ever love you <laughs> and then i think like four bars later he goes like i do <laughs> okay so you're trying to just keep it together you're, you're, yeah. you're trying not to not to lose it on stage yeah oh man but we're slipping into the sorry go trying to lose it a bit because i think that's what makes it a good performance that's exactly right, man. That goes back to what I was saying about how how you like deal with mistakes and things. If you if you're having fun, then the audience will have fun with you. You know, that's that's certainly how I feel as a punter. Like when I go to a show, like yeah. if I see you and Jake whispering to each other on stage and both giggling, I start smiling. <laughs> it's just a human thing, and then it's a fun moment, you know, because I can only imagine yeah. the kind of horrific, evil stuff that's being shared between you. It's the same. It's 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 something that I see with the periphery guys a lot as well. Just like fooling around and you know running around and pranking each other on stage and things like that yeah. you know it totally adds to the show but in the solo guitar context you kind of have to make yourself the butt of the jokes there was one gig in cambridge at the corn exchange where 
literally a tuning peg broke like in between songs like what do you do in that situation yeah just yeah that's it right i mean that was it but i tried to save it so we had a guitar tech at the side and i just basically kind of explained the situation he took the guitar and then he was trying to like drill it out put a new tuner in that's actually oh. why i have one random chrome tuner on on this guitar i still haven't fixed oh. it but um but yeah i just had to just do improvised stand up comedy for the rest of the thing <laughs> just stood there on the mic telling really bad jokes um and it was kind of so you tell a joke and then okay excuse me one second and then i'd run and check on chris and come back it was very much yeah. inspired by seeing people like devin townsend and the crowd work yeah. and that that kind of thing um which i see you do a bit as well in a in a very dry humor kind of one-liner kind of sense which definitely definitely translates i think it's just who you are man to be honest um but it, it definitely comes across as something that's that's planned or at least you know your song intros and everything people seem to really uh, really enjoy that is that is that a conscious thing or is it just you know is any thought put into um, that there isn't and i think every two uh I have remembered that I was funnier than I was on the last tour. So like we'll play the first show and we'll get to the first talking point. And I have this memory of like last tour, I said all this funny shit and I assume that it's going to happen again. And then what I come up with gets progressively worse and worse. Um, but it's still, I guess it still kind of works out, but then it gets to the point where I figure out what's relatively funny and start doing it every night. And then my whole band will start saying it with me as I'm saying it. And like laughing like assholes at me, which I guess is just another layer of the fun. I think it's a exactly. case of we want to play the music as well as possible and therefore everything else should be as much of a, not a joke, but as much of a free expression as possible. Totally, totally. Not to, not to be cliche, but any any shows do stand out to you as as particularly memorable, uh, or shows you're particularly proud of. No. <laughs> <laughs> any shows you you particularly hate, and any any cities you never want to see again. Cities, no. Like there are places that maybe some of the crew or band wouldn't want to play again that I always like, but I think that's. Like, I guess I'm the only one that has the benefit of getting to see my name written on a building. So right. I'm like, well, of course I love that town where we played terribly and no one came and it was raining because, look, my name's on a building. Um, so I think because of that, I just enjoy everything. All the Seriously, I, I, don't, I don't buy that. I don't buy that every single show is, is, is sunshine and rainbows or every experience. I, I can't possibly, you know, I've had, I've had so many, I've had so many terrible gigs or just experiences that, that uh, I don't know, uh, like I mentioned earlier, just, just one particular gig where every time I think about it, I just, I can't, can't get over it. PTSD. Yeah, actually, no, something. I do remember the first time we played Vegas, uh, with animals as leaders, something, this is the only time my guitars ever really fucked up and don't know why, but the entire trim block like dislodged itself so the guitar wouldn't stay in tune and i didn't know why it's because the entire bridge was like snapping into different places randomly oh damn um so i played i think like half a song by trying to just bend each note to the right place as i played it and and then i think i just you, you saw you saw guthrie you saw guthrie govan doing doing it yeah. Something like that. I was like, oh, no problem. No problem. Yeah. Um, so I think halfway through the song, I just walked off stage with no explanation. And <laughs> the band finished the song, which I guess was the right thing to do. Um, and then I had a backup guitar in the wrong tuning. So I stood on stage and retuned it for like two minutes. And then we carried on with the set. That's fine. That's fine. That's live. That's live. That's why it's not. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. It's actually that's what you more pay funny for. than anything. Yeah. <laughs> well, I saw, yeah, I saw, um, 
you know, I saw uh, Tosin with Generation X, that whole tour in Anaheim. And I believe something similar happened. There was some kind of technical issue with his gear or something. And, you uh-huh. know, they were all trading solos and they got to his solo and something wasn't working. And But no one cared, man. It's like yeah. they're stoked to see these people do their live thing. You know, that's what I really miss is the danger, actually. And that maybe <laughs> maybe that's why I like the solo thing is, is that so much can go wrong, danger. you know. Yeah. It's all danger. Yeah, like you, you break a string. What do you do when it's just you and there's no backup guitar? You know, um, it's it's really interesting to kind of figure that stuff out. Um, as, uh, you always travel with a backup, right, I presume? Because the Strandbergs, you have this signature Strandberg that's like super portable, like a, one of these headless yeah. guitars. Um, I rarely have a backup um, because I like the danger. And also the way I travel, <laughs> I have a guitar, I have a double case and I put a guitar in one part and the rest of the gear in the other part because it's a great padded bag. So I'll have like, what, like in ear monitoring all dismantled and arranged in the shape of a guitar in this padded case. Um, and the times I have had a backup, it's had like the strings that it had six months ago in a different tuning. So it's, it's there, but it's not actually going to be helpful because I haven't bothered to restring it or set it up for the show. Yeah. Slight peace of mind, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I once got actually, kicked out was- of Gatwick airport for, Sorry, uh, not uh, uh, just just not having a guitar in a guitar case. I tried to fly using a guitar case as just a bag, and they <laughs> just wouldn't let me on the plane. <laughs> like, I ended up getting literally escorted out of the airport because I got really angry, and <laughs> and Will and Wilson was already through a security on the plane waiting waiting for me and texting me like what's going on and there was no signal in the security area and i i got kicked oh. out of the airport and and had to get picked up by mark mike malian and uh yeah. yeah it's a weird it's a small world man isn't it it's a really yeah. small world with all this stuff but yeah i wanted to mention your guitar as well the Stramberg, because I, I have played it a few times and it's a serious instrument man i, I see it all over the place as well like this is a guitar that's on general sale in most guitar stores, I would assume, because I, I, I yeah. pop into stores all over the world and I see it. Um, Strandberg, Swedish guy, Ola Strandberg, right? How did you guys connect? Yeah. Um, I found the guitars from Nam videos and I was like, oh, that looks really cool. And then I think just emailed him because he was only doing the made to measure one. So he used to make all the guitars by hand to order. And the wait list was a couple of hundred or more people long. So I emailed him um, in pure confidence of my greatness to try and skip the wait list. Like, hey, man, I have 11 subscribers. So I think this is a big deal. Um, but he would just started doing production models um, and just started doing six strings. So I was able to get one of them and then made some videos and I had like 14 subscribers and he was like, wait, maybe we're onto something. And then it's just kind of grown from there. Uh, we did like a trial signature, like 20 units only, and it sold well. And so it turned into a proper model. And now we're friends. <laughs> well, it's an amazing thing, man. It's great to see him grow as well. Because again, like uh, I, I think I played one of his guitars years ago, and now he's. I've seen them move to the new headquarters, and and their range just expands so much, and the, the kind of telly style looking ones come out, and, yeah. and 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 loads more. So yeah, if if you're an acoustic guy listening and you don't really know these guitars, um, I actually found them really really easy to play with my kind of finger style kind of. Uh, I don't know what what I'm used to in terms of the string spacing and even the action because of the way the neck feels. It has this very, very unique neck that sort of, I don't know if it has a special name. I'm sure it does, like some kind of patented thing. Um, But it kind of morphs to the shape of your hand as you move. And it's it's a much thicker neck than a lot of um, kind of a you know, like an Ibanez shreddy kind of kind of guitar that perhaps uh, you might be used to playing. Um, really, really cool stuff. Definitely worth checking out. Um, and of course, if you've heard Pliny's music, you'll know exactly how it sounds and how good it sounds, as you are known as the tone connoisseur. I keep seeing you referred to as the tone connoisseur. Um, really? 
Yeah, yes, yes, indeed. So uh, you need to adopt that. Yeah, maybe you can use it in merchandise to put in with your animals. Yeah. Do you um do you write your own bio? Do I write my own bio? Um, I normally yeah. write. Well, now I have a manager, so okay. I well. I have a manager, but I'm a control freak, so it's a really awkward relationship for him because he'll do something and I'll be like, yes, but can we change this and this? And it's just, it ends up being kind of, uh, yeah, a, a, a little bit of email tennis, which I totally apologize for. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll write the, 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 the points, but the, the, the self-congratulatory phrasing is really awkward but necessary, yeah. so it's best if just someone yeah. else does that. Um, yeah, I mean, back in the day, like when I was a student, I I, I would because you have to because you, no one else is going to do it. <laughs> yeah. But it's it's think, it's nice to have someone else. What about you? Yeah, mostly, but now it's just recycled to the point that I don't need to look at it again. But I think the first self congratulation. Oh, are you still there? I'm here. Yeah, it's just your your Australian bogan internet. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> um, I stole Prog Wizard from somewhere, so I think that's been used for years, but I think Tone Connoisseur is the next one. Dude. And now like, everyone will know that it's some- my own doing. Well, oh, no, I'm, I'm so sorry, but but Wizard, I was always the, a wizard. In, like, that's in, I stole that from somewhere as well. Yeah. So you're Prog Wizard. I'm, yeah, but I look like a wizard, Pliny. How do you know what a wizard I've got the, like? the Lord of the Rings. I look like like when I'm older, I will probably look like like Gandalf. I would I yeah. would hope. Whereas you're more you of a actually will. I didn't want to. Yeah, you're more of a you know connoisseur. I'll, I'll let the uh, <laughs> well. <laughs> I was gonna say sort of Hobbit, but <laughs> uh-huh. hey man, I'm pretty tall. Are you taller than me? You are. You're actually you're probably taller than me to be honest. No, we're at the same. Maybe that's the wizard thing. You have to be kind of a little bit lanky. <laughs> Too busy magicking and not eating. It's much easier to say wizard than like something even like self-congratulatory like virtuoso. Or I hate it when people call yeah. themselves virtuosos. That's the most cringy thing in the world ever. And when anyone writes that in anything, it's horrible because there's, you know... I mean, speaking personally, I'm an idiot, and I know I'm an idiot. I mean, you are a virtuoso from, you know, but you might not feel like a virtuoso for yourself unless you're a musical genius like your friend in Los Angeles. Well, I think that that's my new thing. I'm going to call myself a musical genius. And I'm also going to, not even going to hide the fact that I write my own bio and it's all going to be first person. <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, listen, it's... uh. It's it's been a pleasure to talk to you and catch up, man, because it has been a while and this this lockdown thing for someone who likes to be social, uh doing this kind of podcast thing has been a really nice way to reconnect with people. And it's it's really cool that your album is such a banger. Impulse Voices, twenty seventh of November. Um honestly, I would say it's your 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 finest work as I'm in the honeymoon phase of listening to it. Uh, it's it's much more about the composition, which I think I've heard you I've heard you interviewed in a lot of uh, a lot of places before, and and when we've spoken in the past, you've you know I, I think the last time I spoke to you, you you know we were talking about sort of progressing with the guitar, and and you told me you were taking much more time on just the compositions themselves rather than say working up chops which is something you would have done as a teenager or or growing up you know and and it really shows man i mean this is really really stellar stuff and the production from simon is the best yet i mean i don't know how you guys did it because there's a lot of intricate stuff going on there lots of electronic elements there's even harp from like my old musical collaborator uh amy turk so shout out to amy who's playing some harp on it which is awesome uh it's a brilliant album man and uh yeah if it's uh out right now 27th of november streaming everywhere would you prefer to direct people to a specific location are you doing physicals nah. vinyls things like this yeah you can if you go to my website you can buy all the shit but if you choose to just stream it somewhere that's quite all right there you go everybody so you can go to pliny's website and buy some shit um dude it's been a pleasure <laughs> to see you again uh best of luck with with the release and uh hopefully we can catch up again in real life somewhere for a yeah. coffee or a weather spoons 
It's hopefully not a Weatherspoons. <laughs> Dude, yeah. take care. Thanks, Impulse man. Forces, 27th of November. Peace. Bye-bye. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for checking out this week's episode of the podcast. For more information about this week's guest, head to the link in the description, where you will also find more information about the Tonewood amp, as well as that cheeky little discount you can get as well. Lots of love. See you next time.